Resume the recording. Okay. Just give me a sec. I switched this queen so people can see. All right. You're on to the screen. Okay. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. I uh, apologize. I can't be there. Um, yeah, Ancha, can you hit mute on the thing? Uh, yeah, just in case. Okay. Um, had to be back in San Francisco uh, for some investor stuff. Uh, this is the hot season now up until Thanksgiving. Uh, and then, well, I guess, that, yeah, that's the American Thanksgiving. And then everyone disappears until uh, consumer electronics show in January. So we have a short window here to pitch our stuff and uh, impress these investors. So uh, I think you guys can see my screen. Also, Ancha has a video that we I had just recorded um, and we're using that as kind of a backup. So uh, probably won't talk too much here if Ancha maybe wants to play the video or if she wants to do her talk and play my video afterward, that'll probably uh, be sufficient. But um, let me show you guys kind of what's been going on since we last spoke. Um, one thing I do want to highlight, there's survey.pipeline.ai. Uh, we'd love for you guys to do this survey. This actually, uh, oh, I've already taken the survey, so it's not letting me do it, but it's just uh, survey.pipeline.ai. Pipeline.ai, like that. And um, go there and take the survey. This actually feeds pretty heavily into um, our uh, pitch for the investors. So, you know, like really helps out, helps us understand the target audience. We're uh, focused on machine learning in production and getting models from Jupyter Notebooks and from the uh, research lab into production um, and the ability to actually auto-generate new models, to compile models into uh, different forms and let you test them out. So um, our main website, of course, is Pipeline AI. I'm just eating my morning puffins here. Uh, and you would click try it yourself or you can kind of scroll down. Our big thing is we run on this vote uh, philosophy. We're, we're big fans of voting here in the U.S. Uh, the vote um, has always helped us throughout the years, uh, especially with Trump. Uh, we, we all love vote. So if it's one thing I learned from the Trump uh, thing, it's to get out there and register and go to the the polls and the uh, polls myself and vote and get that guy out of office. Uh, so VOTE, so it's validates uh, continuously, optimize models continuously, train continuously. This is real time model training and experiments continuously. The E goes in and out of explain and experiment. So the ability to explain models continuously is very important to us. We're seeing a lot of folks focusing on this. Even now the H2O guys are starting to get into this area. Um, you know, these uh, neural networks are classically very difficult to explain. One thing we're seeing is people moving to smaller and smaller models um, and then composing those models. So we've all done this on the, the um, right, like training side for years and years. We've used XGBoost and uh, Random Forest and we've, you know, made smaller uh, bits of training and then sort of um, or like combine them into sort of ensemble side uh, like training if you will right so very powerful gives us much better uh, like accuracy and also kind of helps us if we have smaller models and we combine them compose them we can actually start to uh, like reason about the smaller models themselves and then have a fighting chance to actually reason about the entire prediction. So um, there's a project out of uh, Google called TensorFlow Hub, uh, H-U-B, and that's really a place for people to, you know, push their models and then other people can grab them. You know, think of it, um, I'm like blanking on the equivalent, but you know, think of like a place to store, you know, think of it like GitHub for your models, I guess, right? But they give you ways to actually compose them into larger TensorFlow graphs. And it's very TensorFlow specific, uh, but it's a very interesting concept. So we're actually building integrations into TensorFlow Hub itself as well too. Um, let's see, picked up a bunch of new, um, uh, like customers since probably the last time I uh, spoke with you guys, we also joined the CNCF. 
This is our uh, gateway to get into uh, KubeCon, which is coming up in December in Seattle. If you guys are around, I think there was KubeCon Copenhagen uh, a few months ago. I believe Ansha was there, actually. She could probably tell you more about the excitement there, about KubeFlow, uh, MLflow. So actually, last month, or, well, this would have been August, um, we integrated with KubeFlow. We integrated with MLflow. So this is brand new. The MLflow stuff is brand new out of uh, Databricks, my old company, where they're, you know, really kind of filling in that gap between like whatever Databricks does, ETL, boring, batch, you know, um, and then the ability to turn that into things that are usable for the machine learning space. So um, really, you know, the MLflow stuff is a growth um, play by Databricks to get more into machine learning and not be as confined to just the uh, like regular ETL that they've um, been uh, stuck in for the last five years. So the MLflow stuff is actually really, really well designed, uh, has one of the top engineers within Databricks itself um, in addition to Matei, who is the creator of, of Spark himself. So once I saw the support that Databricks was putting behind this project is when really we started paying attention to it. We were a bit worried that they would just do the bare minimum, um, you know, to package up models and then not do anything with them from there. So, um, but they're really, they, they pulled the best people off of Spark um, and off of Databricks and they, they uh, put them on this MLflow uh, like open source project. So it's a really cool project. It'll get you between uh, Databricks and between ETL um, and up to the point where you want to deploy a model. But at that point, you still need something like Pipeline, SageMaker, Google Cloud ML um, to actually take these models, uh, serve them in production, monitor for decay, monitor for bias, uh, you know, and um, start to attach streams and, you know, do all the, the sort of post-training analytics and post-training uh, servicing for these models. There's also one guess, one phase that's in between that like Databricks is not tackling with this MLflow and, and they don't plan to tackle, which is really taking the trained model. So they're training models with MLflow. Um, and once those models are, are trained, you there's this phase in between where you can actually compile these models down even further. You can compile them to the hardware, to target hardware you can compile um, and turn on and off different flags and really prepare them for production. And so that's where pipeline comes in. SageMaker doesn't do this, Google Cloud, ML doesn't do this. All of these services, Azure ML, they just take your trained model and push it into production and, and then they're you know, hands off. There's, there's not much in the way of monitoring or you know, triggering off of certain, um, you know, there's a bit of auto scaling, but you kind of have to wire it up yourself in a very low level manner. This is all built into the pipeline stuff. So. Anyway, that's that kind of further, um, you know, fills the gap between training and what pipeline does is this MLflow stuff. Kubeflow really ends up at the end of the day, like not a lot of people want to admit this, but at the end of the day, Kubeflow is really uh, just a collection of Docker images that are usually two to three versions behind most of the other, you know, the, the current release of TensorFlow, current release of TensorFlow serving there, you know. So Kubeflow really is a packaging system. If you think of Kubeflow like pip, uh, you know, like pip install. Um, and, uh, you know, there's really, really strong, <clears throat> strong design opinions that go into Kubeflow, which are not always ideal. Uh, it's obviously very uh, Kubernetes specific, um, which is, you know, both good and bad. If, if you walk into any enterprise and say you must use Kubernetes, uh, you know there's always the ops guy around the corner that spent the last year and a half of his life trying to get Mesos or you know trying to get Docker Swarm to be stable. So um, also there's in uh, the ingress, so you know any reverse proxies. Kubeflow has strong opinions to use this project called Ambassador, which not a lot of people use. Even uh, down to um, you know most companies that we speak with use Airflow, which is a Python-based uh, right, like workflow uh, type tool. Um, and Kubeflow has talked about supporting Airflow. It's not their top priority. They right now use something called Argo, which pretty much nobody has experience using out in the real world. So my point here is we support certain um, or we actually integrate with, with certain pieces of Kubeflow. In fact, we call it Kubeflow inside, uh, but really it's around some of the hyperparameter tuning, um, you know, some of these 
these edge projects that they have where we're not really buying into the whole um, must be Kubernetes, must be this, because we're, we're out in the real world and, you know, Kubeflow is kind of in its own little world there. So, yeah, so love the Kubeflow guys, love the project, great stuff. Uh, we, we pull out of that uh, specifically what we need to further um, our platform and support the customers. So. Um, let's see. We also have added GDPR support for pipeline. So here's the community edition here. Oh, and actually, if you guys want to get to community yourselves, click on this. Oh, and we're three stars away from hitting 3000. So it would be really nice. Yeah, maybe Ansha, you could uh, create three different Gmail accounts and just, uh, or yeah, three different GitHub accounts and go hit the 3000 mark. That'd be great uh, metric by the end of this. Um, but click on try it yourself here. And you can log in um, however you want. Uh, we have this nice little sign up thing that explains our GDPR in terms of service. Log in. Um, boom. Oh, I want to sign up. I want to sign in. Oh, I keep forgetting the community password. Oh, that's work. So these are sample models right here. So um, things that are in white, we have samples for. Things in gray, we're actively working on samples. These samples directly come from another project off of Pipeline. So a lot of this is open source. Uh, gluing it together and you know making it a cohesive product is not open source. Uh, but go to Pipeline AI models. All of our sample models are all open source. Uh, we have a ton of uh, Jupyter notebooks. If you just replace this models with notebooks, you'll see a bunch of notebooks. And a lot of these um, are already in the uh, community. So from, and then from community, this is actually something um, me and the team are getting uh, tested in, in into the product this week, which is you could do save as. So, oh, so, well, before I get into that, like this is where you could actually create your own model. Uh, from a sample. So this is actually the MNIST model is the sample that we have. Um, B1, create. You can, um, and the goal here is to actually get these models. Um, so these are pre-trained models uh, that were either introduced via ML flow. Um, we have full instructions here. If you want to upload, you can actually drag and drop a TensorFlow model, Keras model, Scikit model, any kind of model that you got, our model, all the ones that are shown on that front page there, H2O. Um, you, you would drag and drop, you would uh, click and create it, and or just grab one of the samples here. The ensemble stuff, we're actually working on this will be the ability to select multiple of these projects, we call them, and have them participate in a single prediction. Um, we'll actually dynamically generate the ensemble that'll call into these. You would specify the ensemble aggregator. If it's a classification, you would uh, specify quorum. Um, if you're doing linear regression uh, or something linear that uh, is going to be returning a numeric value, you could say, I want the min, I want the max, I want the average. Or the best part about pipeline is you can click new and create your own function that will then participate and start showing up in these dialogues here. So this is very powerful. Um, uh, shows the, exp the extensibility of pipeline. So let's drill in. We have a bunch of different versions here. I'm gonna pick the one that I just um, introduced. Uh, I can choose where to deploy it. Now, a lot of this stuff is, you know, enterprise professional stuff. So we're just sticking with community here. Um, you could select GPU. We have TPU disabled. People were taking advantage of it. Um, and uh, GPU actually shouldn't be in the community, but we keep it here because we know people like to use GPUs. Um, this is that phase I was saying after training and before uh, serving uh, the predictions before deploying those models where you can set up a bunch of different hyperparameter to, um, or sorry, a bunch of different hyperparameters uh, for online. So typically when you say uh, hyperparameter tuning, we're speaking about offline hyperparameter tuning where we're changing the model during training and that will affect the training output. Here, we already have the train model. Now we're applying four different techniques, three to the actual model. These first three are being applied to the model itself and they're specific to the model type. So these will only show up if you have certain uh, model types. And then this fourth one is actually more on the runtime, which is request batching. This is where we would turn this on and say, um, you know, we want 1000 
uh, request to come in before we make one uh, prediction and you know pass it to the GPU. So all 1,000 of those predictions will be made, but they'll be made in an optimal way um, down to the uh, matrix, uh, like algorithms, um, uh, like side of things. We would actually create one big matrix multiply out of 1,000 separate um, uh, like requests and then make one big matrix multiply either on the GPU or on the CPU and then send it back and then split up the answers back to all thousand people. So take those predictions and send them to all thousand devices. So there's a lot of cool things you can do here with just a couple switches. Um, let's switch over. So go to hardware um, optimizations. The fourth box here is the run times. So we've made this human grokable. So this is, you know, do you want to uh, try to balance memory and performance and, you know, memory and throughput basically? Um, do you want performance optimized? So this would be like low latency, or do you want this to be memory optimized? Meaning do you want the smallest possible uh, like runtime, um, which is typically deployed to uh, some, you know, small sensor. So if you don't know, and you just want all three of them, you would click all three. Now, one feature that is in the very, very near term is uh, it's um, uh, when you're doing this, you're, you're kind of blindly selecting these things right now because you don't know your model characteristics um, on this particular device or this particular uh, GPU that uh, um, you're planning to deploy to. Maybe this cloud has a different, uh, you know, it's using um, a, a certain chip by like AMD, something like that. So we will be collecting this information that's private to you, right? Like private to your um, uh, particular pipeline installation. And we will be maintaining all of this data throughout. So we'll know that you selected these, these three things, that you deployed it. We're actually going to generate, you know, uh, the combinatorial number of Docker images is, is the physical asset that comes out of this. So during training, you're generating a model. During this phase, the kind of pre-production or post-training optimization phase, we're actually generating Docker images that have, um, right, these optimized runtimes wrapping um, these models themselves. So, uh, like, these models, uh, you know, on disk alone are... Are very boring and and sit still, um, but uh, um, when you wrap them in these runtimes, this is very very powerful. Okay, so scroll down here. Uh, we've got I think it looks like it was generating three different versions here. So it should be it's going to be building these on the back end. So these three get deployed. Yeah, um, you can actually manually shift the traffic, or you can do um, an auto shifter, um, you can actually uh, have, um, have the system, have pipeline actually determine where to send traffic based on, um, you know, if we're trying to minimize cost, maximize throughput, um, if, we're, if we're trying to minimize latency. Um, so, so this is very much application focused machine learning. And our, our goal here is to get these models to predict under a certain, or our goal here is we're trying to get this model down to 10 milliseconds uh, for one single prediction, right? Or we'll, you know, load it up and average will be 10 milliseconds per prediction. If we can't do that, this is not a successful model. Um, so this is now putting more focus on applications needs for machine learning, right? So like this is why we're called the application ML server, right? The, or sorry, the ML application server. We are BEA WebLogic, if you remember those guys, uh, for machine learning um, apps. And uh, yeah, some people call us App Dynamics as well too, or uh, sort of application performance management for machine learning um, on the application side. So if we can't get this model below 10 milliseconds with our optimizations um, and you know, generating three or four different versions to compare, this model cannot be put online behind a specific application. And, and that's just what the customer, you know, that's the first thing we ask is, what are your latency requirements? What are your throughput requirements? What are the memory requirements for um, this particular request response or this stream. So we also integrate with Kafka Streams, of course, and Kinesis Streams and um, MQTT uh, for the IoT side. So um, if we can't get below that uh, like target, then you know these models don't go online. So this is a very, very different scenario than um, 
uh, for most training site optimizations where you're, you're trying to maximize uh, the accuracy and you have no idea, you know, how this is going to do online and you don't even know that there's these post training optimizations that can be done. So we're, you know, very much engineering um, and focused on that side. So two of these came back already. So let's hit this. We can hit a little test action here and it looks like we're getting back. Um, so we're passing in uh, essentially a JSON, you know, this is specific to this model, but uh, we pass in a JSON representation of an image. You could also select image here um, and we get back the prediction. So, so not only, so this is actually a seven, um, the JSON representation of a seven. Um, so like you can send text like this uh, or send an actual binary. Um, and here we're actually getting the prediction, but we're also getting the confidence for that prediction. So the seventh element should be the highest, and that looks like it is. So zero, one, two, three, uh, let's see, there's the seventh. So this is um, cool because now it's not just giving us the prediction, but also giving us the confidence over uh, zero through nine distribution. This is the classic MNIST data set uh, where we're passing in uh, pictures of handwritten digits uh, and so like the next thing here is I could actually look at all the different model variants and see where they ended up. So I'm going to click here. Uh, looks like I only made one prediction there. So let me go back and do another couple. We should actually see the multiple models kicking in. We would see it down here. It'll tell us which variant. So it should be flip-flopping between TensorFlow, um, Serving, and Python. So that's this thing. So those are the two. Uh, that um, had finished. Let's see if the third one's back yet. The third one uh, doesn't look like it's back yet. Okay. Um, also, I should highlight you can um, select the specific languages that you that you want to integrate with. If you have jQuery, Node.js, Java, uh, for those crazy people still doing uh, like Ruby, PHP, we've got you there. But you're on the end. Um, seeing a bunch of Swift these days. Uh, it's kind of fun. Um, so here I'm going to click and actually I could see all the predictions, uh, which model variant was returned and what the confidence was. So we're working on the UI work here, but this thing on the lower left is we're actually grouping by input. So this little hash here isn't really that important. It's just a way for us to group the same input. And so one thing I uh, don't think I mentioned was we can actually put models. Oh, and then here's all the charts and everything of these different uh, variants, we can put models into what's called shadow mode. And actually by default, that's what we're doing. Um, so I could shadow this one. I'm going to then have to bump this up to 100%. So this is a valid, successful, uh, completed configuration. I'm, now, now I should only see uh, which one, TF serving coming back. And, um, uh, but I'll still see traffic flowing to the Python one. So this is very important. So let me load this up here again, clicking it a bunch of times. And in my charts up here, I'm going to still see both models taking traffic, but the only one that should be coming back is this TF serving one, I believe. So uh, yeah, so let me hit this a bunch of times and it shows that only TF serving is coming back. If I wanted to put them both back online, I would just go back and give it 50, 50 split. So this is what we call a shadow canary. And shadow canaries are super powerful because we can still see their predictions for the same exact input. Right, so there's only one input coming in right now and it's just being hashed to the same value so we can plot it. Um, and uh, so if there were any outliers, that would mean there are some models or some, or sorry, some like model variants within this project that are not producing the same prediction. And so here they're all showing the same thing. If there was one that was predicting a five or a two, we would go click on it, we would analyze it, we would see the confidence, and then we would go uh, fix the problem, hopefully. The final, so that's just kind of straight up comparing. Uh, taking it one step further, we have explanations. Uh, this is where we can actually get um, uh, somewhat of an idea of what led to this prediction. So. Um, you know, this is using Lime beneath the covers. Um, there's a framework that we use by my buddy uh, who is at datascience.com, uh, which is now Oracle. Um, it's this project called Skater, S-K-A-T-E-R. Yeah, he lives in LA and I guess he's a skater. 
Uh, but um, Skater lets you actually plug in multiple frameworks. So, you know, Lime is just one implementation, and here's actually two ways to determine for the original image, show us which pixels led to this prediction, uh, which ones didn't. Bottom part of the explanations is just tracing. Just show us, um, you know, like not just how much time was spent, but what actually fed into this prediction, right? So, um, let's see here if I go. So here I can click on a particular, now these are kind of boring because we're not showing the ensembles here, but um, you know, so this is just literally um, each uh, variant produces one prediction, but this is where we would see one prediction being composed um, and being serviced by three different models. And also um, we have a strong Netflix background. That's where I come from. That's where uh, some of the other engineers come from. We um, have built in all of the circuit breakers and all of the you know, Netflix style architecture patterns. This is probably too much detail, but we can actually detect if a particular model is taking too long and we have an aggressive, we're trying to get under 10 milliseconds and one part of the ensemble is starting to take more than two or three milliseconds, we can actually snip it and uh, not take into consideration that model's um, part of the prediction. And so of course on the way out, like we have to show which, which model variants uh, were part of these ensemble predictions and you know, how much time was spent. Of course, that's on the system side, but uh, yeah. So the ability to really, really control latencies um, is, is our strong suit here. So, uh, okay, and I think, and let's see, I think there's a DAG we could show here as well too. That's gonna be kind of boring. It's just, um, let's see, these were two, yeah, this was an older model, um, but yeah. So that's that there. And then of course, streams, um, we're gonna be adding this in the next couple weeks. There's quite a few moving parts obviously with streams, so, while we have it working internally, we're not comfortable uh, launching it publicly, not without taking care of a lot of the edge cases. So we're in private beta with that with a couple key customers. But really the ability here to tap into these prediction streams and, and, and live see, here's my input, which is a two, uh, for example, and here's how these three different model variants are predicting. And, and you know, there's the same confidence that we were describing before. So like while we thought this was a bit ridiculous and a bit overkill, we actually do find people using um, this sort of, uh, this like sort of real time insight into these prediction streams. They find it very valuable. One use case we see over and over is in the retail space, uh, specifically with advanced searches and, you know, right, like searches these days aren't just query searches and page rank. You know, there's a lot of business rules going in here. There's a lot of, uh, customization depending on you know how much vendors are paying to be at, at the top of the search results and they're also personalized to the user so what we want to see here is for the same uh, query string you know let's say it's men's shoes and these are three different models that like Macy's is serving so we can actually tap in and see for the same query uh, what are the top 10 search results coming back is it really men's shoes is it women's shoes is it uh, you know, summertime flip-flops, which, you know, now it's like wintertime, things like that. So you can see right away when these models go out. And the cool thing is that you could even see when these are in shadow mode. So maybe only model A variant is uh, servicing the live audience, but B and C are still getting the same query string and still making predictions. So this is very powerful. This is, this is humanizing machine learning really is um, a term that uh, we use. Um, the, uh, the ability to explain in real time is very powerful, not just batch, you know, 48 hours later, but show me right now what, what actually fed into that uh, particular prediction. The last thing that, that we uh, find really cool with these streams is that we can actually um, detect unconfident predictions. So again, we're the machine learning application runtime, right? We're we're the like application server that's seeing all of these uh, predictions flowing through. So this is super powerful. We could start to build add-ons. And we could even, if you think of it like a little marketplace where we could have little, um, or like different people that are creating add-ons uh, that, you know, either within a single enterprise or there could be <clears throat> a like global marketplace that, you know, people can build specific add-ons, uh, sort of little applets, if you will, or, you know, predictionlets. 
So as predictions are flowing through, we can detect that this is unconfident because we have the confidences across the zero through nine distribution for this case. If they all come back equal, which is the absolute worst case, that prediction still goes back to the user or to the application within 10 milliseconds. But we can uh, sort of asynchronously push uh, um, you know, these unconfident predictions off to somewhere to get reviewed by a human. And so why would you do this? Well, like this is very important because we can now convert unlabeled uh, data into new training data. And this is very, very valuable training data because this is right on these prediction uh, sort of borders, right? Or these like classification borders between zero, one, two, three, up to nine. Um, we want a human to actually look at this and to um, right, like correct this prediction so that in the future. So this is not correcting the prediction under 10 milliseconds. That's, yeah, that's craziness. But this is you know, pushing these things into Kafka. We now have Kafka hooked up to Slack. So we're actually uh, populating a Slack channel, um, which is super fun, by the way, and then letting the human actually correct those predictions in line. Um, and so while this doesn't, you know, this is at human scale, which is not scalable, um, and it's human in the loop, uh, which is powerful if you have lots of people. But so this is where Amazon Mechanical Turk or company Crowdflower, which I think is called something else now. Um, but it's super easy now. This is a pathway to crowdsourcing and to creating new training data. And it's right on those classification borders, which is really powerful. So I think this actually might be working. I, I could pop up into my Slack over there, but um, I'll hold off for now. Notebooks, standard stuff um, you'll see everywhere. Uh, we've got Jupyter Lab. We've been huge fans of Jupyter Lab. We've got a GPU out here for you guys to play with and lots and lots of notebooks. We even have TPU notebooks. Um, so that kind of leads in, you know, this is boring stuff. This is what everyone has. This is just, uh, you know, from the ad hoc exploration, but like you could also deploy models directly from Jupyter uh, with the pipeline version of Jupyter. So that's a, a super slick feature. Clicking save as is the, the piece I was starting to go down earlier. I want to show that you that, so later this week, and uh, we actually demoed it last night, um, you can select which cloud that you want. Um, you can either deploy onto your um, own uh, like Amazon account. This is what our surveys are saying. For those of you that are filling out the surveys, we're curious to know, what is your preferred deployment? Is it your own account? Are you okay with the SaaS model? Are you okay with us you know, spinning up um, your environment and then you just having your own subdomain? So this is the community uh, like edition. So it's community.cloud.pipeline.ai. We could have ancha.cloud.pipeline.ai. She would have her own that would be hosted by us and uh, managed by us. So yeah, we're curious. Um, you can also select which instance type basically, um, fill out some configuration parameters um, that's not public yet. And then you would launch. And this will actually create you the subdomain. Uh, so that would be ancha.cloud.pipeline.ai. Uh, you would then, from then on, you would go uh, up to your browser and do Ancha. And you would have a completely walled off environment on whichever cloud that you've chosen. Um, so I think that's it from my side. Please start the repo and fill out the survey, survey.pipeline.ai. Thanks guys, I saw Ancha's talk last night and it's awesome, so stick around. All right. Thanks Chris. Are there any questions in the room for Chris right now? Before he drops off. <laughs> All right. All right, no questions, Chris, so. Cool. All right guys, thanks a lot. Pound to take it away. Yeah, good luck. Yep. Thanks, Chris. Bye bye. All right, let me just quickly. Share my thing here. All right, slides coming up, all good. <laughs> so, 
We heard from Chris about the Pipeline AI um, product and solution for machine learning end-to-end -end pipelines. Uh, maybe before I start with my talk, because that's a little bit more on the, on the infrastructure container side and data side. What are your job roles? Are you kind of data engineers? Are you coming from, from the business perspective and looking for new solutions here at the conference? Maybe if you just want to shout out a little bit more technical business or what you're doing. Engineer? Okay. Engineers? Data scientists? Yeah, cool. Anyone who is kind of non engineer slash data scientist? <laughs> I'll start on the semi technical. Okay, okay. Business operations. Business operations, okay. Fair enough. Okay, perfect, thank you. So, um, yeah, I guess my name already uh, <laughs> was said a couple of times until that. Um, I'm working at a company called MEPR. I'm not sure if that's uh, something you know. Have you come across that name? I guess, yeah, one of you, okay. <laughs> um, that's perfect because then I have. Kind of a nice story to tell you tonight. <laughs> um, basically, what we're doing and what my idea was for the session today, and I hope it's of interest for you all, is show you actually how a modern data platform can help solve many issues. Um, either it's around putting stateful applications like databases, etc., in a containerized environment and really build kind of a production environment um, that might even span different locations, data centers, or on-premise in cloud, which Chris also just highlighted. Um, and how can you really make the data available to those applications? Um, I'll talk on the idea of the stateful applications, but in the last part of my presentations, I can also touch the AI space, where we're just starting also to, to move into as a company with our technology. So this is also interesting for the whole machine learning AI space, because as you just uh, in the beginning, many of you have already played around with container technology, so I guess you're developing with, uh, with containers and then, yeah, putting maybe the models into production and kind of, yeah, what we just seen like swapping around and benchmarking and having shadow models and everything. So we can also uh, provide some great benefits there, which I'll touch on the later part of it. So actually, uh, it's kind of a fun hashtag. Um, one of our customers um, some weeks ago at a conference came to us and he is already using that bar and he said, actually, you're kind of the Kubernetes for data for me because I have Kubernetes helping me with the applications to be agile and deploy anywhere, um, but I was missing that link for the data actually. So he came up with a custom of ours for that to uh, kind of Kubernetes for data and we really liked it. So it's kind of becoming this viral hashtag. <laughs> um, feel free to, to retweet if you like. So yeah, a little bit on my background, um, working as a partner engineer, alliances engineer, so work with our business partners um, on developing solutions together, on integrating our solutions from a software perspective, etc. Um, a lot of my topics uh, include big data, analytics, and now over the recent month, uh, a lot of container and Kubernetes technologies. Um, I'm kind of a, yeah. I'm really excited about the whole machine learning AI space, so I'm uh, happy to be here for the first time at the Variety Conference. Um, uh, hopefully, a couple of more to come. Um, I also um, lead the Women in Big Data chapter in Düsseldorf in Germany, so I'm not sure if that's uh, familiar. So it's kind of a global organization that helps promote um, in uh, yeah, attracting more female talent in the space, and I think that's also not just big data, but also the, the AI space. And uh, I see a lot of uh, women in the room lately, so uh, I think it's even a little bit more females already in that space than in the traditional engineering space. I studied computer science, so I think we were like 4% of women in there. Um, yeah, so I hope promote that a little bit in Germany. We also have chapters here in London and other regions in Europe. So if any one of you, um, also the gentlemen obviously, want to help in supporting and um, yeah, finding and then attracting women to the technology. Um, feel free to, to reach out to one of your local chapters. All right, so let's start. I'll do a quick recap on containers and container orchestration, not to bore anyone, but just to have everyone on the same um, page. Talk a little bit about the challenges and then dive into what you want to look at. Um, if you look for a modern data platform, how you can handle data persistence, and then as that, uh, touch a little bit on the uh, AI bonus track as we are in our conference. 
All right, let's jump in. So in general, I mean, yes, everyone is aware of that difference between virtual machines and containers. So when we look at virtual machines, it's more like a whole computer in a box, right? You have your operating system, um, your applications, etc. Whereas a machine is more kind of an application in a box, right? So you focus really on what does the application need and uh, a layer on top of that, and it's really kind of a more lightweight architecture than the traditional virtual machines we're really using or are still using. In terms of an architecture, a little bit here on the graphic side, what does it mean? It's a whole um, computer in a box, what I just said. You're using hardware operating system, you have a hypervisor, and on top, um, you have the virtual machine, which comes with another get operating system, um, the libraries, and then the application. So it's a lot of overhead there. Um, the containers give us a pretty lightweight way to deploy applications together with libraries, but you share basically the hardware and the operating system. So as you can see already, it's uh, much more agile and flexible and less overhead in there. Another famous comparison, I guess uh, you probably have come across that also a couple of times maybe, um, pets versus cattle. So uh, I hope there's nobody who has a farm. Because <laughs> it's not going to be nice what comes up. So basically, if you look at the pet, obviously, we all love them, we care for them, we give them names. And yeah, but the cattle is a little bit different. <laughs> There's plenty of them at the farm. Um, sometimes they're branded with numbers. It's not nice, but that's how it works. And um, well, that's our expense. So that's a little bit the comparison, right? Your, your virtual machines, if there's something wrong, um, you troubleshoot, you spend hours and hours in trying to figure out what's wrong. Why is it booted up anymore? Why is it giving me an error message? Whereas when a container, there's something weird. You don't care, right? You kill it and you start a new one. Problem solved. So containers are stateless, are lightweight, are portable, um, especially famous with developers and uh, data engineers, obviously. Um, they are moving into production, so it's not just us playing around on the laptops, but companies really deploying containerized applications um, on a broad scale. Docker made it popular. I think uh, that's also a known, and uh, we have a lot of new terminology and jargon to learn. But containers have a problem. And actually, this is a survey Chris mentioned shortly on the KubeCon in his talk. Um, the Cloud Native Foundation is where Kubernetes is kind of home nowadays. That's the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And apart from running those KubeCon events, which are pretty uh, popular nowadays, um, they also do a lot of community work and helping new projects to, um, to mature. And they also do kind of um, big service across their members and community uh, people. Um, this is one just from August this year where they asked, what, what's the challenges you see with deploying containers? And there's, there's a mix between kind of the, um, the people problems in terms of how can I change my organization, how teams work together. We had a discussion with DevOps in the past. Now it's kind of the data ops. So it's even including more and more different teams, it's not just the developers, the operations, but now also all the data science, data engineering teams that want to kind of be included in the whole uh, cycle of deploying the applications and models, etc. So we don't change those challenges overnight, obviously, it takes a little bit of time. Um, but when we focus on the technical challenges, many mentioned it's about how to secure containers how to monitor, how to deal with networking issues and the storage and where to put the data and get access to it. Just for an example, things that Docker itself can't do, it can't monitor running containers, handle dead containers, um, auto scale, or uh, if probably you all have worked with it, it's, uh, it's quite a nightmare to solve all the port having issues in there. <laughs> um, so, what does it mean? I mean, we can't really move away from those small pets unless we have an environment to support the cattle, right? And to handle the container state. So, Kubernetes came along. And Kubernetes actually, I guess, probably also, some of you should know, um, was originated at uh, Google 
So they've been actually working internally with containerized environments since a long time. And at some point um, around 2014-15, they decided to open source kind of a general framework that was based on their fork project, which is Kubernetes. And you can actually read through their publications, so it's uh, all available online. It's quite fun to, to read. Um, and as I said, it's now home at the Cloudview Computing Foundation. So everything you want to know about Kubernetes, um, it's, uh, it's really all be well documented, the mini cube before they get started, play around with the laptop, etc. That's a good resource. So what is Kubernetes? Just a quick walkthrough. Um, it's an API and agents. It provides containers with all that what we need. Scheduling, configuration, network, and storage. So it helps really to manage the cattle we were just talking about. And the runtime manages the container. So we have a container orchestration with Kubernetes. A little bit on the, uh, on the visual. Kubernetes, we have applications. Kubernetes starts the container for us somewhere. We start another application somewhere. And Kubernetes also does a really good thing in kind of helping the containers talk to each other, find each other. So it's taking care of a lot of those concepts for us. So we don't need to think about this virtual machine that has names from the Hobbit, maybe. <laughs> it's really just kind of require um, our YAML files. The application container gets created somewhere at our Kubernetes cluster. Um, we can just uh, be happy and trust that the system will take care of everything. Why is it so popular, Kubernetes? Um, as I said, I guess one of the big reasons it's coming from Google. So as a big developer um, community already at Google, it also found a lot of contributors now in the open source community. So it's really backed by Google, but also taking really, really a, a huge uptake here. Um, and there are other container orchestration platforms, right? But it's not the only one. But again, here from the survey um, from the CNCF this summer, you can see that Kubernetes is, is kind of the top choice for many of the, uh, of the companies. There's also Docker Swarm, Mesos, that around. Uh, many of them also included actually the Kubernetes support in their platform. Just because, I mean, Kubernetes, as you can see, is the clear leader in that, in that space right now. So as I said, to handle the, the cattle, the, all the containers, um, Kubernetes is an open, pluggable framework that helps you doing that. So there are a lot of um, pretty popular projects. The Kubernetes is kind of the, the overall orchestration, but there's also projects around monitoring, about logging, um, how to connect the different services in a service mesh architecture, etc. How do I solve the networking part? So it's a lot of famous projects. You might have come across one or the other. And what it gives you is really a choice. So you can start with Kubernetes as an orchestration platform. You want to include a specific networking solution. So you can have uh, different operates there, plugins, etc. Um, monitoring solutions. And those are just the top projects. If you go to the website, and there's a quick link you can also open on, on the mobile phones, actually it's the landscape, so it's l.cncfio. You get a whole picture of projects which are working with Kubernetes and integrating and developing. So it's not just the one choice you have for networking, for security, um, for service interactions, connections, etc. It's It's a ton of them. So it gives a really good flexibility to you um, if you want to step in that space and help kind of bringing that development environment maybe to a larger deployment in your organization. Okay, that's great. So we have kind of a platform to orchestrate the containers to help us schedule, monitor, et cetera. But we still have one problem, and that's the state. Meaning, what about my data, right? So I can now deploy applications anywhere. I don't even care where they get deployed as long as there's enough resources computed in the memory. The applications still need data. So why is it a big problem with the state in containers? Well, state messes things up, right? If you kind of save state or data inside a container and you kill it, it's gone. 
if you want to synchronize or replicate state across different services, it just makes the services kind of complex because it's not that stateless microservices architecture anymore, right? With one service not depending on another. So it's kind of all those those challenges and, and, and normally you as application developers, you don't think about how to design a system with all those dependencies. You don't want to and you don't need to normally. So how can we help here? So if you look again at the Kubernetes environment, you have your three applications deployed in containers. Um, the applications itself, they do RPC calls to each other, that's fine. That's taken care of. But many people still talk about stateless microservices. But the reality in those cases is something like this, that still a single microservice needs to ingest maybe or read a little bit of data past maybe a state or a result to the next microservice or application, and even might write a log file, which you want to have access after the container is killed, right? Because those applications, they might be alive for in a couple of seconds, a couple of minutes to their job, and the containers are killed again. But in case something um, goes wrong, or you want to kind of just analyze later what happened, what the application did, etc., you need to persist the logs, for example. So in all those cases, basically, you want to persist data that survives whatever happens to this agile container environment. And we basically need different forms of persistence. We might have files, we have like streams of information and uh, maybe tables, database tables as well. For application. Okay, so the idea is why not having an external data platform where I can save everything to you and then still work with my containers, but I can access the data when I need it. Or when one application is killed, another one is started, it can pick up where the other one left off. So we need a data platform. What does it need to have as characteristics? Well, it would be nice if it's kind of one namespace across the whole Kubernetes cluster. Meaning, independent if the application starts on your Kubernetes host number one or number three, it still has access to the same set of data units, right? Independent which which host. So across a cluster is nice. Well, your company might have even different Kubernetes cluster. You might have one cluster in your data center, another one in the cloud, at Google, at Amazon, at, at Microsoft. Wouldn't it be nice if the application, regardless where I started, has access to the data needs? Obviously, we need to store a lot of different files. We're living in a kind of a very diverse world. So files, tables, streams, whatever. Um, it should take all of the, the different formats. Scale, performance, obviously, and um, access control, GDPR, data security. So you want to make sure that you can control who has access to the data and what kind of data. If you want to anonymize data before you get access to it, etc., whatever. So you want to have kind of a possibility to put in um, policies for that as well. So the data platform actually needs to be like Kubernetes, right? It packages the data and it provides the data whether the application is running in the cloud, whether it's running on premise. But yeah, Kubernetes, but just for data. And this is where we at uh, Nebar come into the play. So what we're providing is software, a data platform that can take in all kind of data. So we can store files, you can um, push tables, objects, streams, and store it in our platform. And actually we have an OSQL database as part of the platform. We have a streaming um, system, so publish, subscribe, real-time, event streaming system included, etc. So we can handle all of those types independent where you deploy. So we can offer this if parts of it are running on premise, parts are running in the cloud, and we basically span kind of a, a data fabric or whatever you call it, a data where above and can provide the data where you decide where you need it. So you can have your different pods, containers, applications running somewhere, and through a lot of open APIs, you can get access to the data. So in case you're running containers in Kubernetes, 
you would integrate natively um, with the tools that Kubernetes and the other um, provide and get access. If you have a machine learning algorithm, I don't know, that, that's maybe not running containerized, but can use an NFS POSIX API to access data that is stored somewhere, we can provide that. Or if you're using analytics tools, Spark, et cetera, that's assume there is an HDFS and how to process an API, we have that API. So our idea is really to be kind of this abstraction for the data between the infrastructure and the application and serve the data where it's needed, following policies, obviously, that you put in place in terms of who has access, where data is replicated to, etc. So in terms of characteristics, obviously, um, scale is important so we can start small but we're coming from a big data background so we can scale into the the exabytes on um, our largest customers i think have cost of running on a couple of thousand physical limits and then you can imagine if you combine those with, with different deployments on premise cloud etc basically that's that's the idea you can start small but as more and more data gets generated and you need more data to put in the platform just scales with you Anywhere, so if it's an Ash location, if it's um, on your laptop, <laughs> even um, on premise in the data center in the cloud, you just deploy our software and we can federate those installations. And it appears to be one global data fabric to the applications. All the, um, the characteristics that your IT department will probably ask is it highly available? The disaster recovery in terms of one data center goes down, can you replicate to another one? Um, we can provide all that, so we have data snapshotting, replication, etc. You can even say, like, you're generating data in your data center, but you want to replicate to a cloud for disaster recovery purpose. Um, that's also possible. And you can obviously decide intelligent placement um, if you want to have it kind of a, a very fast performing environment, or you want to kind of offload part of the data, all the data, to, to another tier, as it's called, so another storage environment, which might be a little bit more cost efficient. So we organize, and just quickly, um, data in so-called volumes. So volumes is just like a directory on your laptop. You create a volume for users or for projects or for, for model A, model B deployments, etc. as you like, like a directory. And based on those volumes, you can then decide, is the volume to be snapshotting? That means, um, for example, nice for data scientists and then data engineers, um, if you want to version your models, you can create a snapshot at a time, give it a version number, develop the model further, snapshot it again. So it's an easy way also to do this version, just out of the box with those tools. And you can always um, deploy back whatever it's snapshotted. So it's a consistent endpoint um, snapshot of your data. And even if you delete data, if there's still a link and a snapshot to it, it will disappear from, from the visible folder structure, but the platform will hold on to the data because it's saved, let's say, in the snapshot. So um, the physical data on the disk is only erased after you deleted it when the snapshot pointing to it is also deleted. That's a really good way to, to kind of, uh, yeah, to kind of use it for versioning of models, etc. Um, permissions, access controls, etc. Whatever you need to kind of make sure that your company also is kind of happy that you're playing around with data sets. Coming back to how to build that data platform across geos or data centers. So we have a functionality called the global namespace. So this is globally, but you can also just imagine like having two different data centers or um, locations could be within the UK, could be within Europe could even be, indeed, globally. You deploy um, the environments. You can give it a name. And like a folder and directory structure, you can navigate. So you will have like a global root name space. In this example, it's just called Navar. Could be your company name. And you can have the different locations. Um, the interesting fact is that it doesn't need to be just only data centers on premises. It could be partly an Azure cloud environment. It could be partly an AWS, could be a Google Cloud. So you can even test with the different public cloud providers and manage your data in a single 
as well. So the whole deployment, and you can navigate. So if you have an application that thinks data is mapper slash EU cloud, it will navigate to that folder, see the data set. Regardless whether this is a cloud or on-premise, right? For the, for the application, it's totally transparent. And you manage where data is replicated to, where it's national, it, etc. You can completely define your policies centrally, like for one platform, and then apply it on a global level. So you can say, like, the data that is generated in the EU stays in the EU, or the one is generated in the UK based in the UK. <laughs> um, data from the US might be okay to replicate over, etc. So whatever you need really to, to fulfill your compliance needs as a, in the company, you can build um, and model around that. So you get a global data here in a single namespace. You can still do distributed processing. You can run models in, in the US, you can run models in, in the EU, you can run it in cloud environments. You can test if the model is better performing in the cloud environment than on premise, for example. But you always have the controls. You can always pull data back. If you say um, you're working in AWS here in Europe, you say, well, I just tested it, but after a couple of weeks, you want to pull out the data again. So you just either replicate it out, or you just, if you have it already somewhere else, you can just pull it. So it's giving you a lot of flexibility. If you use it for um, data recovery, um, disaster recovery, or just like testing out like a path to, to different clouds and environments. So what this gives you really, this was a little bit technical, but in terms of what's in it for me, what, what can I do with it? It gives you the application of data portability because you can start up your container, your application in AWS, gets access to the data it needs. Container pill, you start the container in, in Azure, it gets access to the data it needs because the platform is managing that from a global perspective, right? So you have the complete flexibility for your applications to move somewhere else because the data is just ensured to be there and available. And you can also just for synchronization purposes, right? If you want to make sure the data is available in different locations. And this is basically giving you flexibility that you know in Kubernetes, right? With, I can develop my application in the container and fire it up, it doesn't matter which environment it is. As long as it speaks Kubernetes, it's taken care of. So we can now offer the same thing for your data. How do we do that? We have a little bit piece of software we can put in, for example, a Docker container. It doesn't need to be Kubernetes. You can also include that client in a normal Docker container. So it just gets um, installed when you actually deploy the container, build the container. Um, that makes sure that little piece of software that you have an authenticated and secured access to the data platform. You can also kind of ensure that this application is authenticated and is authorized to have access, which a normal Docker container doesn't care about, right? It sees the volume it runs to it. What can I do with it? I mean, you can have your microservices, for example, running containerized. And as I said earlier, they might need to pass on information in real time, write down log files, etc. They can do that. So you spin up the microservices, they can write files or read from tables that are in the platform. They can pass on real time event streams to another microservice. And the fun thing is that we always persist the stream data in parallel. So even if you want to check later what happened, um, you still have the information available. But the stream is acting in real time, obviously, and passing information. So you can build quite powerful microservices architectures this way without putting too much state in the application model. So coming back to the Kubernetes, we also have the possibility, question how do we integrate with Kubernetes? Um, we integrate with a volume plug and driver that Kubernetes designed to enable that external storage is visible in a Kubernetes environment. So we have such a volume driver um, that integrates natively with the Kubernetes APIs 
And those volumes that I showed earlier, which you create in the platform, can be made visible and available to your Kubernetes environment. So you persist data, um, you can scale the data as the data grows and performance grows. You can leverage all of the mechanisms that's natural in your application that I mentioned. Security, that everything is really authorized to have access to read and write, and also multi-tenant. I'll we'll touch on that just in a little bit. There are two ways you have static and dynamic provisioning. I'm not sure if that's of interest, I'm going to just go quickly over it. Um, static means you already create a volume and then just map it to the application. That's kind of worse. Yeah, you know in advance that you need that volume. So what happens in, in Kubernetes actually is um, we have the plugin and it communicates um, with the mapper environment and says, look, um, can you please give me that volume that's called whatever uh, model one? And then it's, uh, it's now. The container that is using the YAML file definition um, says a persistent volume. It requests it through our piece of software and the platform delivers back the volume in the YAML file. This is how it looks like. So uh, you say volume, give it a name, and then say here where it's mounted. So it's the path to data in that bar, as I showed you, could be the global namespace. And this could end up to be kind of a volume that is in the cloud or a volume somewhere, right? Because it's the path. That's always so uh, easy to, to just define them. We can decide later where it's residing or change that. More fun is the dynamic provisioning. So talking of this cattle and it's going to be dynamic and I don't want to take care of pre-creating those volumes. I just, just want to fire up my application, say, well, that needs the volume, obviously, but I don't care. You do, right? That's kind of what it's supposed to do. So there we have the dynamic provision. So we have a little piece in there in edit service, it's called the provision of them, and that helps in orchestrating that. So what do you do? You have your YAML file definition, but this time you have a persistent volume claim. The claim requests a volume of a certain storage class. And storage class means that you can define different types of storage, like super fast storage or like, yeah, cheaper storage because I have a lot of data, etc. And then the provisioner takes that request, requests the volume, and it gets dynamically created at that point, right? And then mounted back. So you don't have that as an administrator pre-create those volumes. The application claims I need it, and the only thing that the administrator takes care of is having those storage costs available for Kubernetes, and then it just consumes and dynamically creates. YAML file is a little bit more complicated, but it's if you go into that and work with that, it's, it's becoming quite, uh, quite okay. You just have the provision in here, and then you're following what I said, you have the volume bound, persistent volume claim, and it just define those, and in the end, it's just coming together. The consequences. Stay is no longer a dirty word for Kubernetes. So this plugin installation is pretty straightforward. You just fire it up against your Kubernetes, API, so it's not something you need to do on a node basis, it's just like um, on a global Kubernetes level API integration. Um, you can then use it for all of your YAML files, right? You just need to define maybe the storage classes, etc. But then you can integrate that. Also, if you're using like Helm charts to kind of automate um, deployments, etc., you can use that. And you can decide whether you want to have the storage and the compute closely together for kind of data locality purposes, or if you want to separate the Kubernetes environment from the data platform and kind of scale independently as you like. So to wrap that part up and then go a little bit to the AI, um, what you can actually build with such a modern data platform is kind of have this global data management that spans whichever infrastructure you choose to use, right? It might be nowadays a small data center environment your company is giving you. It might be tomorrow that the company says, well, we just signed a contract with AWS, you're going to move everything in there. The other day it says, well, Azure had a better offer. We're now in Microsoft. Um, this helps you to be independent of the infrastructure decisions, right? You have an open set of APIs, S3, REST, 
POSIGs, if you need HDFS, etc., which you can use, and integrations in Kubernetes. And then you have really this kind of Kubernetes platform, or whatever you want to call it, where you deploy your applications, Kubernetes takes place with that part, um, and we can help you to manage the, the data is where it needs to be. All right, questions up to here. I hope it was a little bit kind of interesting for you to see what you can do with containers. Um, the SRF and AI conference, I, uh, I have a sneak peek. The AI demonstrate how Kubernetes actually helps in place Qubit to bring together the data teams and, and the IT department. But more from the AI side. So the data science phases. Um, probably you all aware, we have um, the different phases like exploration, you're playing around with um, with algorithms, with models, output is code. You're training the model, then you're pushing a lot of data to it to see if it performs the way it should. Um, train it on different data sets. The deployment then is kind of probably microservices architecture where you put it in a production environment, um, yeah, or you deploy it, and then at some point it's tested and, and reach and move into production. Then it's kind of getting you, hopefully, the insights you're expecting. The containerization, as you just uh, confirmed that most of you are using already, it's, it's really good for machine learning because in the exploration phase, you can isolate different deployments from each other or development environments. In training, you can vary a little bit with uh, or play around with compute and uh, parameters and have a new model, etc. And then deployment gives you kind of this possibility for microservices, etc. So we all know it's good. What we can help you with, again, with a platform in that area is that everything is in one cluster on one platform in our case. So if you have other teams maybe that are focusing more on traditional analytics with Spark, etc., um, they can run their queries or applications on the same platform. You can run your whatever you're using, um, TensorFlow or other environments on the platform. And we can have this multi tenant setup. So the IT, which in most of the time probably is taking care of um, the infrastructure and hopefully providing that to you, um, they can manage that and give you kind of your dedicated part of the data platform, right, in terms of multi tenant and making sure that whatever you deploy doesn't interfere maybe what the, the Spark analytics team is doing or, or whoever has access and, and runs an application. So you can either separate like development, deployment, production on the platform or different teams or different use cases. And we normally have customers that run between 10 and 50 different applications on the platform. That spans like different teams as well. Also, as I said, you can use like different APIs, which we have, right? So the Spark team might say, well, I need the HDFS API. I need Hadoop. Do they really? Because they just need the API. So we don't need to be a, a Hadoop system, which all the complexity that it has to provide the API. TensorFlow, Python, PyTorch, they have never been developed to, to use Hadoop, right? So they expect totally different um, APIs to work with. Um, same with the, uh, with the notebooks, etc. So we can run all of them on the platform. And if it's something really exotic, we just put it in the container below. We use the word containers easily. So it gives you a lot of flexibility, even for the frameworks and languages that might just come out tomorrow or next week. So sometimes I feel like every week there is some company open sourcing some AI and machine learning language and tool set that no one has heard of. Um, the week before. So we're pretty sure that whatever comes out next, we can just run it on the platform because it's, it's an open set of APIs, we support containers, so pretty sure um, that we can support even the future languages and tool sets as well. That's an open approach actually to data science, which we're trying to, to present. Um, you can use it for the different tools, for algorithms, for architecture, if you're working on Kubernetes or if you're working Without containerization, it's also obviously possible to just have directly access to the data. It doesn't need to be a container environment. Security model, as I said, um, we can 
give you high throughput as well. That's sometimes also important, especially for the training on the model. When you need a lot of data and you need it quickly, because it takes time to train. Um, so we can help there. Another interesting fact, when it comes to um, the multi-tenant setup, which I mentioned, if you're familiar, Kubernetes has namespaces. So if you deploy an application, you can normally give it a separate namespace to kind of have the separation between them. And we also have a concept of the namespaces, right? So you can have, for example, coming back to, to those volumes, a user namespace where you put the user A, for example, another space where you put user B, etc. And this meshes super nicely with Kubernetes world. So you can have this multi-tenant setup leveraging the multi-user or multi-namespace architecture here in Kubernetes and the data platform. There's a lot of kind of nice um, functionality that works together. So to kind of sum up that part, um, the different phases, exploration, training, deployment, many of you said you're using containers. That's, that's I guess, what, what most of the people do um, in the industry might be running on Kubernetes already. And what we can provide is kind of giving you the Kubernetes for data and kind of helping you to bring the data where you need it. And you can basically use whatever tool or end-to-end -end workflow um, environment you want to use. And we're actually currently looking at um, what you want to use. Right? And just maybe finding the loop back to, to what Chris presented. Um, it could be a framework if you decide to test pipeline AI, right? Which is giving you um, the possibilities to kind of have this end-to-end -end machine learning workflow from developing the model, training it, and putting it into production, as we've seen. Um, so you could probably integrate that easily with a member data platform and just have the data pulled out of that um, layer and serve it back. Could be other tools. So um, if you're interested in that solution, just give me feedback or anyone at MEPR if you go to our website. Um, there's a lot of information. Um, we're super interested in learning what would help you as a data scientist, as a data engineer. Um, because we really think that we can help you with a lot of maybe the uh, challenges around the data sets. So this could be one option. Um, if you have another favorite tool, just uh, yeah, let us know. And we're looking into that. So summary, I think uh, we had a lot of uh, talk and then we can open up for questions and feedback. Just to summarize, so containers give you the application agility. Putting that on a Kubernetes orchestration platform gives you also the flexibility and agility where you deploy. Having the integration with the data platform gives you the data agility, and not just for Kubernetes environments, but for traditional like non-orchestrated um, containers, if you like, or for any application you just want to deploy directly and have access. And this is across any infrastructure. It was really the nice part, right? could spend different clouds, could spend um, different on-premise deployments. So that's basically the container Kubernetes without limits. Um, there is more information if you're interested. Um, just go to our website, mepar.com, and follow the links to AI, Kubernetes. Um, there's a lot of more information around that, videos, with demos, etc. Also, um, Ted Dunning and Al Friedman just released um, a new book at Strata Conference, actually, in uh, September in New York, around AI and analytics in production. Um, it's available for free download at our website. So if you want to read that, it's really, really good. It talks a lot about the concepts, um, what you want to look at to, uh, to put AI and analytics in production. And also the book they released before, Machine Learning Logistics which talks about that in most cases, it's not so much um, the model development, but it's more of a challenge how to actually get the data to the model, right? Especially if it's in production and you want to flip models and you have kind of different traffic streams coming in. There's a lot about this, what they call the ML logistics part, um, rather than which, which model to use or developing models. So really, really good books. Um, I don't know if you know Ted and Ellen, um, Ted is uh, 
part of the uh, Apache uh, Foundation and sitting in the, uh, in the chairs there and helping a lot of projects um, yeah, to, to mature. Um, they're both working for MFR, which we're really, really proud of. Um, yeah, but they're working a lot really um, with the with startups, with, with projects, and um, have a lot of expertise in the sector and yeah, publish many books. So if you're interested, please download on the website. And um, with that, I say thank you for your attention. Thanks for staying all evening with a nice weather outside and for coming. Um, sorry when the location was a little bit confusing, but yeah, you all managed. So thank you very much. <laughs> and also, if you want to support the Women Big Data, I just stood there for, uh, for information. Uh, we're across our social media, so whenever you look for that logo, um, there are a lot of local chapters, even on the meetup side. So if you want to join, maybe. Um, UK, the London meetup group, the Ireland meetup group, wherever you're coming from. Um, we have two in Germany, Düsseldorf, which I lead uh, with two friends of mine. We have another one in Munich, we have Russia, and we have the whole EMEA group. So feel free to also support and uh, yeah, and join us there if you like. Thanks. Questions? That was a lot of information to me. <laughs> So just quick feedback, was it on the topics? Was it okay? Yeah, perfect. Good, thumbs up, alrighty. All right, I'm here at the conference also all day tomorrow. So maybe we uh, see each other at the, uh, the sessions or in the breaks. And thanks again for coming.